Well, welcome, everybody. I look at the clock. I now get to say this afternoon instead of good morning. Um, thank you for being here. We are very pleased at the West Virginia University College of Law to present uh, this year's John W. Fisher II Lecture in Law and Medicine. This is an annual event at the College of Law. It is a signature lecture series for us. Uh, and in law and medicine uh, is, is, is apt at this time in our history because the university and the College of Law are about collaboration and interdisciplinarity, and this lecture is, is exactly that type of thing. The John W. Lecture, uh, John W. Fisher, the second lecture in law and medicine was established uh, through the generosity of Thomas S. Clark, MD, and Gene Clark, and the Clark Family Lecture Series, which is funded by a half million dollar pledge, provides lectures across the campus in 10 fields of study. John W. Fisher II, as many of you know, was a member of the College of Law faculty from 1968 to 2014. Now retired, uh, he is the William J. Mayer Jr. Dean Emeritus and the Robert M. Steptoe and James D. Steptoe Professor of Property Law Emeritus. John is my mentor, he is my colleague, and he is my friend, and he is a friend and mentor and colleague to everyone on the faculty, and indeed, even though now retired, to all of you students. And it is our distinct honor to present this annual lecture in law and medicine that bears his name. I'm gonna turn the podium over to my colleague and your professor, Sean Tu, who will introduce our speaker for today. Sean. Right. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the 2015 Fisher Lecture, Professor Christopher Holman. Uh, Professor Holman is a man after my own heart, receiving his PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from UC Davis, uh, then going on to receive his JD from uh, uh, Bolt at UC Berkeley. Um, after law school, Professor Holman went on to pat become patent counsel at several uh, biotechnology firms, managing their patent portfolios and IP, portfolio, IP litigation portfolios. Uh, Professor Holman also has a diversity of teaching experience, having taught in biochemistry, extension, and at the business schools. Uh, I think I admire Professor Holman most because our backgrounds are, are so similar. Um, now that I say that, it seems kind of self-congratulatory. <laughs> okay. In any case, uh, he's really been a, a mentor to me. And interestingly, I first met Professor Holman on a, a lark, which is apropos because he's a avid bird watcher. Um, I really got to know and respect Professor Holman, however, when I read a blog post of his that was posted uh, about a genome medicine article that argued that the human genome uh, was covered uh, by patents. The whole human genome was covered by patents. Specifically, the author argued that a mere 58 patents covered about 10% of all human genes. I found this hard to believe, and Professor Holman actually uh, wrote a blog post showing that the article was uh, completely false and based on garbage data. Uh, long story short, we wrote a letter to the editor, uh, got many patent professors to sign on, uh, and we sent the letter uh, to the editors in April of 2013. Uh, I went back to my old emails, and uh, he said, quote, uh, the people pushing this agenda are very cynical, uh, and I don't think they care about objective reality. Uh, unfortunately for us, this turned out to be true. Uh, this relatively short letter took three rounds of peer review and didn't publish until about one year later. I've had Cell and Nature articles that were shorter than that. Uh, I was amazed at how uh, scientists who are supposed to be uh, objective were so resistant to an argument that seemed uh, pretty crystal clear. Uh, I, I mention this story only to uh, say that Professor Holman has always been dedicated to objective reality and speaking the truth, even when it can be unpopular and difficult. Uh, this is especially important since uh, the U.S. is moving away from manufacturing and more uh, towards intellectual property and IP playing a more dominant role in our economy. Uh, so we really need more people like Professor Holman to speak the truth about how uh, property rules affect innovation and economic growth. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Holman, who will be getting us exhilarated about the intersection of IP law and copyright law. All right, thank you, Sean. Um, thank you, Dean Bowman, Sean, Josh, 
and all the people who've um, you know worked together to get me out here and to host me so so nicely. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to provide time for questions and commentary, so I'm going to try to wrap up the presentation in a half hour, which is an extremely short amount of time, but at least try to give you a little flavor for what I'm working on, because I know it's a, a pretty um, foreign concept to most people, the idea of copyright for engineered DNA. And really, it's not DNA, it's really engineered genetic sequences, and it's fundamentally based on the growing convergence of the engineering of software and the engineering of DNA and the fact that software has been recognized as copyrightable since you know, 1980 um, and we still haven't gotten there with uh, engineered DNA. So 1987 I started my PhD program at UC Davis. Uh, uh, first evening we had, we had a little reception with the professors and one guy who became my thesis prof you know, professor gave me a book called Protein Engineering. And it was all about designing new proteins that would do things that just do not occur with naturally occurring uh, molecules. And to engineer proteins involves engineering DNA. So I, I was on that path of trying to engineer a new functionality by engineering DNA. Uh, later, uh, many years later, I was a patent attorney. I worked for a company called uh, Maxigen, the DNA shuffling company. And what we did is we, we made um, synthetic DNA, synthetic bacteria, synthetic genomes that did a variety of really important things in medicine, agriculture, green technologies, a lot of really important things. And the dominant paradigm was you'd use patents to protect these innovations. We, you know, in biotech, patents were huge. Um, but there was real deficiencies, there was real problems. It was less than optimal a lot of times. And what I could see was uh, patents were increasingly not um, the best solution a lot of times for what was going on with what was becoming called synthetic biology, which is kind of the, 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 the next iteration of biotech. And I saw that, um, became a law professor, and as a law professor I started teaching copyright, which is not, I'm really a patent guy, I'm not really a copyright person, but I, I'm becoming that, and I, I think I've kind of become it. Uh, because as t teaching it, I learned about the protection of software with copyright. And the more I learned about that and the policy behind it and the nuances and how it's applied, the more I saw that you can't really justify, in my mind, um, drawing, you know, denying it to engineer DNA. I think the huge conceptual leap was taking copyright, which was for aesthetic works, artistic works, and extending it to software. So you might, you might realize that the most functional software that's in your automobile that helps figure out how much air fuel ratio, you know, your garage door opener, all this, this very functional software, it's a bunch of zeros and ones telling machines what to do, it's covered by copyright. Once you accept that, it becomes very difficult to explain why you can't copyright engineer DNA, at least in my mind. And I'm sure uh, uh, a lot of people will have a problem with that, and maybe we'll get some interesting... Uh, questions. Um, oops, that's the wrong button. How about this? It's not a new idea. Interestingly, Irving Caton, this is a pr very prominent law professor, George Mason University, 1982 wrote an article about it. And it's hard to, you know, he, he hit the nail right on the head. And basically what he said was, he's a, he was doing a copyright CLE uh, in around 1980. Somebody came up to him afterwards and said, well, why can't we copyright engineered organisms and engineered, engineered DNA? And it's very telling. The professor was shocked and perplexed, and I think that's the normal response. When you first hear it, he was shocked and perplexed by it. But being a good academic and an honest person, he went and he, and he really immersed himself in the question, and ultimately the, the, the answer was irrefutable, that you could not, in his mind, that um, you, you, once you've acknowledged copyright for software, you, there's no basis for denying it to engineer DNA. He identified a number of policy advantages of that. Um, but every, like you said, every intellectual and emotional prejudice um, rebelled against the notion. And I think that's what I see all the time, because I, I, whenever, you know, it's a very normal response you get from people and from the copyright office that, no, you can't um, copyright DNA. But the more you kind of immerse yourself in it and start going down all the, the alleys, the more you start to see, well, um, why not? Um, I think if you're coming from the perspective of a engineer, of a genetic engineer, we call them synthetic biologists. Anybody here consider themselves a synthetic biologist? Okay, um, thought there might be somebody from another department or something, but anyway, 
Drew Endy, he's a really, very prominent, he's at Stanford University. He does synthetic biology. He does not want to be called a biologist. He's an engineer. He's my cousin's husband, so I know him fairly well. Uh, but he's a very high profile um, guy, probably the most high profile guy in synthetic biology. And here's what he said, you know, given the history in software, um, there's going to be an ever-renewing enthusiasm for copyright. Here's what I think is interesting. Literally every student I see who connects with copyrights immediately presumes you should be, able, be treating this stuff like code, and they are familiar with using copyright. So it's a, it's a hard leap coming from the lawyer perspective, I think. From the synthetic biologist, once they understand you can copyright computer code, they can't figure out why you can't copyright um, genetic code. Okay. Um, Copyright has a history of expanding to incorporate new technologies. In the beginning of the country, it was maps, charts, and books. That's all it was. And it's expanded to incorporate music, photographs, motion pictures. Not until 1972 was sound recordings. Um, in 1980, we, uh, we started recognizing it for c computer programs, even though Congress never amended the statute to, to incorporate software. But the courts have, uh, have assumed that Congress thought the software should be included. Um, and I think for the same reason, engineered DNA should. Why do we have copyright for software and not engineered DNA? I think it can largely be explained on pragmatic grounds that prior to 1980, um, it, was, it was an open question whether you could patent computer programs. And actually, there was a couple Supreme Court decisions that said, uh, no, you couldn't, at least for those particular programs. So in 1980, it looked like you couldn't patent them. And it was becoming increasingly important commercially. These, you know, Microsofts and companies like that were starting to develop that you needed some form of IP. Um, there was a commission called the Contu Commission. They did a report in 1979. And basically, they, they said, if this is a really nice quote, um, but basically their point was, if you have something that takes a lot of investment to create, but it can be duplicated very easily. Examples could be a, block, a Hollywood movie that you could burn off your DVD, or recorded music, or computer software that you can copy easily. All these things, um, like computer programs, if you can't protect them with some kind of IP, no one's going to uh, invest in creating them because they're just going to be so easy to copy and, and uh, pirate, basically. And that's why they said we need something. And so they said, why don't we, use cop why don't we enlist copyright to, to protect it? I think that same argument applies to DNA. If you think about it, when they, you have problems with people um, like illegally sharing music files and so forth, they call that viral replication because you can make perfect copies very easily and just disseminate them over the internet. The word viral comes from DNA. That comes from biology. The fact that DNA makes perfect copies of itself, and once you've, once that perfect copy gets out, it's the basis for more perfect copies. Um, this is why a company like Monsanto has so much trouble, uh, and they re rely heavily on patents because once they sell a soybean with um, patented technology, without the patent, uh, it's very easy for a farmer to grow up as many soybeans, and and those soybeans can be create more. Um, it's very analogous to software. Um, so we treat software as literary works. There's a literary works category of copyrightable subject matter. We have this fiction that it's a literary work. That down, but see that object code, it's zeros and ones. It's something that only a computer could read. That is copyrightable, okay? So it's kind of a stretch, but at least it looks a little literary. Let's see. Oop, I think I, oh, I'm, I missed a slide. Oh, well, I was pruning and I lost one of my slides. But what the slide would have showed you is what a DNA sequence looks like. G-A-T-C-C-C. It's a string of letters. It looks as much like literary work, and, or more so maybe, than, than object code. Um, biotechnology, do I? I'm very limited on time. The point is, conventional biotechnology, you would basically Maybe take a human gene, cut it, put it into a piece of DNA that can reproduce in a bacterial cell, grow a bunch of bacteria, and now you can produce human growth hormone or insulin or things like that and sell them and provide them as a drug in a way that never could be done before. That's Genentech, that's Amgen, that's, the big, that's what biotech was. Relatively simple. Um, patents were very good for this type of um, technology because 
uh, these are billion dollar products, you know, so you could justify, you know, getting a lot of patents and it worked pretty good. Um, the way it's going now, synthetic biology, much, much more complex, creating synthetic DNA sequences, different kind of combinations, um, very important for um, a lot of reasons outside of medicine, kind of green technologies and so forth. Um, but um, not amenable to these kind of blockbuster products, okay? And so uh, that's one of the reasons patents will not work so well. Um, so I wrote a paper about the changing IP imperatives of biotechnology. Um, for a lot of reasons, even though patents have historically been very important for biotechnology, um, as we move into this new synthetic biology, they're working less and less well. Um, at the same time, DNA and software is increasingly converging. And if you talk to a synthetic biologist, somebody who makes synthetic DNA for a living, um, they would say that, well, DNA is really analogous to the piece of plastic that comprises a DVD or something like that. It's just a medium of it. It's just a medium. Um, the real value comes from the code, okay? And so a you know, if you get a... a, a DVD disc and it's got a computer program or a movie or something on it, the piece of plastic is not worth much, but the information on it could be worth a huge amount. That's how DNA is. DNA is the plastic. DNA is the medium that you can use to convey information to a cell and cause it to perform various functions, but the real value is in the information content. And it's gotten to the point where anybody can easily contact a company like DNA 2.0, and they will make whatever DNA you want. Give them the, but the value is in the information, and that's what copyright protects. It's, it's got that kind of information. Um, DNA is a programming language. This is how synthetic biologists talk. Um, these are just kind of showing you the analogy that basically the struct, you know, I'm, I'm cut for time, but the kind of the structure of a computer program, you can write it in this kind of flow chart. Well, you can do the same type of thing for engineered genetic sequences. Um, BioBricks Foundation. This was started by Drew Enti, that synthetic biologist I mentioned. Um, let's see, what do they say here? DNA encoded biological functions. Talking in terms of biological en engineers programming living organisms. The point is, here's a, 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 a synthetic biology company. I think it's a spinoff of Cal Berkeley. Uh, talking about living factories, reprogramming microorganisms. The point is, in the world of synthetic biology, it's totally merging. Computer engineering and DNA engineering are becoming very, very similar disciplines. Uh, there's another example of that. Um, there's a growing interest in this, actually, as a practical matter. Um, first reference I saw of somebody, this is a Solera genomics, really. is one of the, the top... Um, uh, companies, there's kind of a race to do the human genome around the turn of the 20th century. This is one of the, the big company doing that. Their, their IP counsel, he was actually um, saying he, at the time, and he thought that these sequences they were coming up with should be able to be registered. So he apparently attempted it, but he didn't push it as far as I have, which is actually appealing a, a denial from the Copyright Office. But pr apparently he was actually trying it around the turn of the 20th century. Um, Indian Patent Examiner. This is, uh, I know, an attorney from Monsanto, and he was over in India at the patent office trying to explain to them the idea that you could patent DNA in, in seeds. And one of the Indian Patent Examiners said, well, I don't think you should be able to patent that, but shouldn't this be something for copyright? That was just his intuition. It's probably somebody who's coming from more of a scientific perspective. Um, myriad decision. Probably, I think everybody might have heard something about this at the Supreme Court uh, banned the patenting of genes, okay? You've heard of that. What it means is maybe it's going to, maybe patents aren't as effective as people thought they were for protecting biotech. Maybe that's another reason people are looking more for copyright as an alternative. Um, there's a law firm that I kind of shared this idea with, and I found out kind of through back channels that they were kind of going around pitching the idea to big biotech companies, let us be the lawyers, and we're going to move forward, and maybe we can sue infringers for copyright infringers, try to make law 
in this area. And DNA 2.0, this is a company founded by friends of mine who worked at Maxigen with me. I think they're the biggest DNA synthesis company, gene synthesis company in the US at least. And they're very interested in copyright. So we filed a test case with the Copyright Office trying to register. And maybe I'll talk about that a little bit as, as time permits. But people are getting, you know, serious people are getting serious about this idea. Um, patents and copyrights can coexist. Um, for a long time, we've had patent protection for computer programs, because like I said, 1980, it wasn't clear. After 1980, we started getting a lot of patents on computer programs. They do different things, though, copyright and patent. Patent is more about functionality, the functions that are performed. It can be very broad and problematic protection. Copyright is narrow. It's the specific code. So they kind of work together. Um, and it's kind of a good thing because we did have a, another Supreme Court decision a couple years ago called Alice. And in that case, um, basically um, invalidated a software patent. And the repercussions are, if you follow patent law, you'll see that pretty much every day a court is invalidating another software patent. People cannot get them from the patent office so well. So people thought they had patent protection. They have patents, but they're all being... Uh, certain types are being all struck down. So maybe it's nice that they do have copyright as a backup. Um, and the nice thing about copyright, in, in many ways, it's much less problematic in terms of precluding people from uh, being, being too broad and, too, and, and, and causing problems of, of preventing people from doing research and those type of things. Uh, copyright, you know, you'll see, a, if you do a little search, you'll see that software people, many of them hate patents, and there's a big push to just, uh, we don't want patents for software. You don't see him saying that about copyright. And I think the, the, the reason is it's a much more fine-tuned, kind of nuanced um, protection. OK, what would be some policy advantages if we go down that right, route? I think the main one would be protection against what I call piracy. You know, there's different ways to infringe a copyright. You know, some. Um, rapper kind of samples a little bit from some piece of music and puts it into something else, or somebody writes a song that sounds similar to someone else's. Okay, those, those get the attention. Those are what we talk about as law professors. But really, what copyright is mostly good for is piracy. When somebody just verbatim copies, when somebody just burns copies of uh, Microsoft software, somebody's software product, or burns copies of movies and sells them at the flea market, or, you know, out and out piracy where there's no question that copying has occurred, okay? That's where I think copyright is really powerful uh, and is better than patents. And it could be very important for DNA. Uh, right now, where you really see piracy is with seeds, I think is the main area. Because with a lot of seeds, like soybeans and so forth, you know, once you've sold one, um, people can just make as many copies as they want, and those copies can make more perfect copies. Um, it's very clear, it's intentional, you know, in a lot of cases, you know, it could be, you know, I'm not talking about it happening to grow in someone's field or something, but that's not what people, that, that's not what causes problems for Monsanto. It's people who purposefully go about saving and, you know, buying other people's saved seeds and so forth. I think it would be very good f for dealing with that kind of piracy, but also as we advance and synthetic biology becomes more and more important, it's gotten to the point where the information and the DNA are fungible, is how a synthetic biology would say it. Would say it. In other words, if someone puts that DNA code on the internet and it gets disseminated, anybody can just order that DNA from a company like DNA 2.0, okay? And also just DNA in general self-replicates. And so it's very easy for someone to kind of steal and just copy. And so I think the, the beauty of copyright is it would be a good tool for policing against that without the going too broad and covering maybe research uses or somebody who's interested in copying the function of DNA as opposed as you know which would be permitted under copyright law as opposed to just out and out just copying something which is so easy um, and that was remember the Contu Commission in 1979 that's why they said copyright was important for software because it takes a lot of investment to make but it's too easy to copy. You need some effective protection for it. Um, during questions, I'll probably get um, some uh, concerns. And one of the top concerns you hear a lot is, well, what about um, 
naturally occurring DNA sequences? What about people's genes and so forth? Is this going to harm medicine or, or in, uh, enslave people? Or you know, it, it, when you start talking about DNA and property rights, people get nervous. Okay. Um, in fact, there's an originality requirement. So if you, you, you can, you know, I could spend three hours. Um, I'm not going to, but, uh, you know, going down the list of various doctrines of copyright law that address these issues. But one, there's an originality requirement uh, of copyright law, which I would say means you cannot copyright any kind of naturally occurring DNA sequence. Um, to be original, it has to be original, and it has to have a certain level of creativity. The Supreme Court said some modicum of creativity. So it, it wouldn't cover naturally occurring DNA sequences. It wouldn't cover sequences that are only slightly changed from nature. But at some point, you'd get to a, a level of engineer that, that would be covered. Okay. But naturally occurring shouldn't be a concern. Infringement requires copying. This does not apply to patent law. Okay. Once something has been patented, um, it's infringement, even if somebody else invents it independently. There's no copying involved. It's still infringement. Copyright law doesn't work like that. If you independently come up with the exact same DNA sequence, you're not infringing. You have to show somebody has really copied. Okay? Leaves a lot more room for other people if they want to go do their own independent creation, even if they come up with the same thing. Um, there is literal, um, non-literal infringement. The danger, of course, you know, I'm going into copyright law, so I'm, I'm going to try to, to bring you along with me. Uh, the idea, remember I mentioned, it can be infringement, even if it's not an exact copy. The song sounds similar. It's still infringement. There is some scope of protection. So Sean mentioned that last night. Well, if it's just literal copying is all that infringes, it would be very easy to get around by changing the DNA sequence a little bit. There is a copyright doctrine that would... Um, well, in the case of software, it would mean that if you take a Microsoft Word product or something and you tweak one little line of it, you're probably not going to avoid copyright infringement, you know, if it's substantially similar. I think that would apply to DNA, where you'd get kind of a very narrow protection, but it would be uh, there, some, some ability to stop people from just kind of circumventing it by some slight change. Um, one of the big issues, Bowman is the big case. I don't know if you, but there's a Monsanto v. Or Bowman v. Monsanto, I guess, by the time I got... That was a different... That was a different <laughs> I, have a, I have a handwritten letter from the man, uh, Farmer Bowman from Indiana. He wrote me a letter um, because I wrote an amicus brief in the case that he didn't like. But <laughs> nine justices agreed with me. Uh, and, but one of the big... So he's a farmer, and he's infringing Monsanto patents. And one of the big arguments there, he was definitely an uh, intentional infringer. But one of the arguments was, well, the danger of patents is, what about some poor farmer and a seed blows onto their land and a uh, patented plant grows up? Are they going to be liable for patent infringement? Uh, I think probably not. But copyright, it's much more of a clear answer. It's a, it's, it, there's much better protection against um, inadvertent infringement. It's clear that a volitional act is required. 1995 decision is is kind of the first in a, in a string of cases that basically say, you know, even though this internet service provider, for example, is technically infringing copyright because they're posting infringing material, there was no volitional act. It was one of their users who posted it. So they're not going to be held liable. Um, there's uh, the DMCA, probably a lot of people have heard of, kind of a safe harbor for internet service providers like YouTube and Google. Um, under copyright law, there are a number of established doctrines to protect inadvertent infringers from charges of infringement. Um, and that's kind of a general theme, is that copyright, particularly in the context of software, has already developed a number of doctrines that would address a lot of concerns people have about IP protection for engineered DNA. Um, here's an important one. It's called the idea expression dichotomy for anyone who took copyright law. Um, but the bottom line is copyright does not tie up functionality. It only ties up a particular way somebody chooses to express functionality. Um, so in other words, a software patent might broadly cover any method of shopping online where you can purchase a product only clicking the mouse once. That's the famous Amazon one-click patent. It, doesn't matter what what the code looks like if you it covers that functionality that's you can see why people don't like software patents some people don't um, 
Copyright only covers the specific code that was used to accomplish the function. Um, it would not cover the functionality. So somebody who wants to achieve the same function and is willing to write their own code to do it, they're not going to be infringing copyright. Okay? The way copyright works, if there's only a limited way of achieving a function, um, there's no copyright protection for anybody. It's called the merger doctrine. Um, if you need to use certain software elements to make a program interoperable with Apple products or you know, interoperable with some other product, you can't copyright that. Okay? There's a number of, doctrine, uh, of, of copyright doctrines that apply to software that really limit your, uh, and prevent people from tying up functionality with copyright. Those would all apply to DNA, I think, in a very helpful way that patent does not. Um, I think everybody's probably heard, uh, at least at a law school, of the doctrine of fair use. It's, a, it's why you can, uh, why I can make handouts, you know, copy Xerox things, or I shouldn't say the word Xerox, but uh, <laughs> photocopy uh, and, and hand out because, well, it's fair use. In other words, there are, there's, it's a defense to infringement. You're infringing the copyright, but there's a statutory defense called fair use. And I think it could be very, it, it does not exist for patents. There is no fair use in patent law. There's a very minimal, if not insignificant, research use exception, probably in, pretty much uh, insignificant. Fair use um, could provide a very strong research exception under copyright law because some people are concerned about that. What about the effect on research? Um, if you go through the factors that you look at for fair use, non-commercial, socially useful, academic type uses all favor fair use. So somebody who's doing academic research, particularly if it's seen as being non-commercial, it should be, that weighs heavily in favor of fair use, as opposed to a competitor who's totally commercial where maybe you're gonna be able to prove infringement. Um, it definitely permits any copying that is necessary to understand how it functions, so that's pretty much absolute, um, transformative uses are favored. So if somebody is just pirating, that's not going to be fair use probably, but if you're doing something new and useful with it, um, probably will be. Um, the factual nature favors fair use. A book on history receives more, what is it, a, a book on history compared to Harry Potter, um, you'd be able to rely more on fair use if it's factual because you want to make it people able to access that factual information. I, I think that would apply to DNA, particularly if it looks like something that occurs naturally. Little harm to the market. If somebody is doing something that's really academic research, it's probably not going to harm the, uh, a company like Genentech's market. They're actually going to be, encourage it. When, when I worked in biotech, we loved when academic researchers infringed our patents because they were promoting our stuff and expanding our market. And if they come up with something that's covered by our patents, so much the better because maybe somebody would like to commercialize that, okay? Um, copyright law has a number of statutory limitations. So it's something we've, there's very little of in patent law. There's very little statutory exemptions for research use, things like that. There's tons of them in copyright law. So it's really well established, this idea, there, you know, for, like for example, for software. Technically, you know, if, if you've got Word on your computer and you launch it, you've made an infringing copy just by having it on your RAM. Okay, um, the statute addresses that. There's an exemption for that. So a lot of the concerns people raise with DNA, if there's a DNA specific concern, there's a, a long, established precedent of in introducing exemptions and compulsory licensing schemes in copyright, which does not exist for the most part in patent law. Um, I like those pictures. I just, because one of the, <laughs> what, uh, you know, what you hear all the, what, what I, what you hear all the time is, but yeah, it's DNA. That just, isn't that sacred or it's nature or it's just, isn't it wrong to be thinking about property rights for DNA? And I, this, you know, um, biotechnology has been around for a long time. You know, a dog is basically a domesticated wolf. And that looks kind of like my dog. And that's a wolf. It, the point is, humans have been messing with, they've been genetic engineering for a long time. The food we eat, if you compare the corn on the cob you can buy in the store with what it came from in nature, they don't look at all alike. Tomato, it's, we've been doing genetic engineering for a long time. 1980, the court, the Supreme Court said you can patent genetically modified organisms. 
at that time, there was all these scientists and people saying, well, this is terrible. You know, you're opening the floodgate and, and biotech is just going to be a disaster. Um, but we've, you know, so we've gone down that route. And so basically, um, I don't know, if, if, if you object to property rights and DNA, you, you can. But as a society, we've kind of left that behind uh, many years ago. Um, I want to end, wrap up quickly for questions. Let me just talk, let me give me a couple few minutes. I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing at the Copyright Office. It's probably informative for students in particular. Like, how do you change the law? How do, how do, you, how do you go about doing it? How, um, the fact is um, software became copyrightable even though Congress never amended the statute to say you, it's copyrightable. We just treat it as literary works. Okay, um, there is a copyright office that registers copyright, but that's, it's not like the patent office. Patent office decides if you get a patent or not. Copyright office just registers, so they don't—they're not the final decider. But it can be uh, there can be a presumption that they know what they're doing if it goes to court. So it's really for the court. We were talking about video games. Josh has a little history in video games, and that's the the strongest case we have is. Um, the, someone tried to, the Atari tried to register the breakout game. It's a good game written by the Steve Jobs of Apple, right? It's like before they did Apple, they wrote breakout. And they're trying to register the, the display that would play on the screen over and over. And the copyright office said, no, you, you, you can't, that's not copyrightable. They, you can appeal that decision in the court. And in this case, Justice Ginsburg of the Supreme Court while she was still on the Court of Appeals, she decided the case and said, no, the Copyright Office is wrong. This is um, creative expression. It, reach, it satisfies originality. You can't deny it just because it's kind of a new form. And I think we could do the same thing. We could attempt to register, be denied, appeal it to the courts. That was kind of our idea. We went through the, we did appeal at the Copyright Office. It, it, nobody was really actually to foot the bill for hiring lawyers to go and actually um, go to court like Atari did. But we did um, get a response from the Copyright Office, and it was kind of interesting. It, it took many, uh, over a year, I think, to get a response to the appeal that I wrote. And so I did this with DNA 2.0. It's, it's a the gene synthesis company. They had a synthetic gene that they had made, and they, as a test case, they said, let's try to get this registered. So we did it. I was their lawyer. Uh, pro bono, just because I was interested, and I did the appeal for this. Andrew Torrance is another professor who worked with me on it, and what the they it was the, it it got significant. So it says significant consideration. This is excerpts from the letter. They had their top policy lawyer address this, and he said, you know, this is an issue of first impression for the Copyright Office, uh, whether you can do it. Uh, significant consideration. They denied it, um, and they gave a number of rationales. Um, None of them really hold water, um, you know. So they, uh, you know, for example, they said, "Well, there's these enumerated categories in the copyright statute, like literary works and so forth. It doesn't fall into one of those, and we can't create a new category. Um, that's just false. They, they can't, they, maybe they can't create a new category, but the statute is written, these are non-limiting examples. It's very clear to any, any lawyer who's read the statute, um, uh, professor, they're just wrong there. So they were wrong on the law and, and wrong in a lot of ways, but I've actually gone a little longer than I thought. So I think what I'll do is those are, that's, those are the, the rationales. I can discuss that if anyone wants, but I think I'd rather open to questions and we could get back to that if that's the way we go, or maybe we'll, we'll go a different direction. Okay. Professor Holman, um, that was a really good, really interesting um, lecture. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Um, I thought you did a great job of explaining that if you accept um, the copyright of software that you have to accept this. I thought that was a very logical um, explanation. But I had two um, issues. One is, well, why should the copyright of, why should we copyright software? I realize that the law has said that, but you're, we're law professors and we can, we can encourage the law to change. I mean, we mm -hmm. get to overrule Supreme Court justices all the time, we get to do that, right? So my first question is, I'm not really sure that was rightly decided. 
And then why, it, my instinct, and it's a very uneducated instinct because I'm not a patent or a copyright lawyer, so I'm, I, my instinct would have been that you should patent these things. And you, all you've said software, is, is that, are you talking about so, software? both software, and both, yeah. I, would, I would say this then, mm -hmm. because I do, I do buy your argument that they're related. So, and, rela uh, and so I don't understand, could you go through the steps of what's the difference between patent and copyright? And then my third thing is, it seems to me the problem with copyright, I love your argument that um, if you have to put a lot of research into something, then um, no one will do it because unless it's protected. So I agree with that. So I think that you need some sort of intellectual property protection. But what I don't understand is why you need, with copyright, it's like 75 after, years after the death of the person, and we have the Disney exception. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous. And I say this as someone who actually benefits from this because my family has lots of copyrighted stuff, mm -hmm. and it's like 100 years after the person, not that much, but very long time, and we're still getting money from this. And so but I think it's ridiculous, frankly. And so I guess what I don't understand is why would you be willing to like cut off the remedy and say they could have this copyright as much as, because for patents, I think it's only about seven years or something like that. Your patent, or 14 years or something. Am I wrong about that? Less How long are patents less for? Less than 20 usually. All right, 20 years, but that's not less 100 than, right. 20 years. It's much shorter, yeah. There's a, that's my point. So those are my, those are my comments. So hang so I, I probably won't remember all three, but I know you're, <laughs> I, know, I know the second and third. Okay. I know that, so the third. I can't remember all three The either. third one, so I'm going to start with the third, so the okay. duration. And so I think, so for example, um, there's a lot of people who have, you know, so Mark Lemley is a professor at Stanford, so he collaborates with my friend Drew Endy. Um, so he's got a law professor collaborating with the synthetic biologist, and he's telling, oh, it's not a good idea. Um, but when you, when you really, we, I've engaged with Drew as a synthetic biologist, and at the end of the day, the only objection to copyright for DNA that withstands scrutiny that we've ever come up with is the duration, that it's, it's, it's just too long. Okay, and so I agree. So there's a couple answers. On the one hand, I, I don't think it's that big a deal. So it, it, it applies, you know, software has these, the same kind of really long duration. Um, I, it, I don't think it's turned out to be too huge of a problem because you, as long as you're making original things you're in, and not copying, um, it's not going to be an issue for you. But and you could other, fix it by I, being yes. willing to say for these types of works, it's yes. only for 20 years and give it the patent or something like that. Yes. So if I had more time, I would have talked about maybe. So maybe what you're getting at is that maybe copyright is not correct, but there's definitely problems with patents in, in this context. Sui generis protection, maybe we create right. its own That's type of point. protection. Yes. And so, you know, there's a history. Boat hulls, um, circuit boards. We do have sui generis, so Congress created sui generis protection for these things because there was kind of, they were in kind of a little loophole where it wasn't covered by anything. And I think the problem is most people don't, a lot of people don't think these were too effective. And so they, they try to, instead of creating lots of new forms of protection, like a, a, new, a protection for software or DNA, a lot of people think you're better off trying to shoehorn it into an existing as to creating sui, sui generis. But in, ter in particular, in response to the duration one, why not? I think it would be great. Why not have a shorter duration for engineered DNA? That's part of my uh, what I think is good about copyright. There's no precedent for anything like that in patent law. Actually, in copyright, there is much more precedent for providing um, less, you know, dividing up subject matter and providing less rights. There's a proposal for fashion. So fashion design, there is no protection. You might right. know that. And there's been these proposals for, you know, three or seven years, like a very short protection. I think that would maybe address your concern. that You could have some kind of um, specific shorter protection for engineered DNA. So I think I agree with you. Um, question number was, two. Oh. Number two, I think, was IP versus... Like patents versus Patent, copyright? Yeah. yeah. So that's a really good question. Why would someone prefer one over the other? Patent, okay, copyright. The way you get copyright is fixing in a tangible medium of expression. In other words, if I, and, and in other words, if I come up with a little poem and I write it down or I make my PowerPoint, my PowerPoint is copyrighted. Anybody student who takes notes, their notes are copyrighted. As long as it's been fixed, it's copyrighted from then. So it's a very low barrier. So when it, 
it, it, assuming it's copyrightable subject matter, the fact that they either synthesized the DNA or even wrote out the sequence on paper, they would have copyright. You don't need to register. Patent is totally different. You don't get a patent unless you go through the patent office. So you apply to the patent office for a patent. It's very expensive, very uncertain. It takes years a lot of times to get a patent. Um, so that would be an advantage for synthetic biology um, and for computer programming is if you've got kind of, if you're making a lot of products, a lot of new DNA sequences and there's kind of a your version 2.0, 3.0, and it's coming along at a pace of every year, so you're, you're getting a new version, kind of like software, patents will never catch up with you because your patent is not going to issue for years later based on what you filed earlier. So patents are, are very expensive. For a synthetic biologist, they're prohibitively expensive because they're making all these different permutations. They can't patent them, okay? Um, that's, that, that's why DNA 2.0, a company like that, um, for them, patents are a problem because they broadly cover function, but they're very expensive and time-consuming to get. So I'll give you an example. That sequence that we tried to register with the Copyright Office, it was a synthetic gene for a fluorescent protein. A fl that was the Nobel Prize recently because it's a huge tool for research. You can basically cause cells to light up when certain things happen. Okay. The patents on that technology were very broad, and, and a, the patent owner asserted that they covered any fluorescent protein, even new ones that you come up with. So DNA 2.0, they synthesized theirs from scratch, and they still were getting threatening letters from this patent owner who said, well, we, we basically patented that function. So from the company's perspective, they don't want to have patents like that around. They'd rather be able to copy the function and make their own new sequence for doing it. On the other hand, they don't want someone pirating and just getting a hold of their sequence and just rote copying. So you see, on the one hand, patents um, provide much less oppressive kind of protection for downstream innovation. On the other hand, they're much cheaper and easier to acquire, and they do provide meaningful protection. If, if what you're interested in is not stopping other people from creating fluorescent proteins, you just rather not just copy us without giving us something for it. Yeah. Thank you so much. And if you think of question one, I don't know what it was. But <laughs> All right. So uh, thank you again for coming here. I, 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 I preface this by saying I agree with most of what you said, and then I'll, I'll give you some pushback from, yeah. from, from uh, some, some arguments that I think will, will come up. Uh, and this is really at the intersection of functionality and facts. So, as you know, uh, copyright uh, does not protect functionality under Baker v. Selden, and it doesn't protect factual information. Uh, I think that's rule v. Feist. Um, how do you separate function from information, especially in a DNA context here? It's, it seems to me that it's unlike uh, uh, computer programs, A, because uh, there's only one way, supposedly, amino acid-wise, to get to the same function, even though the sequence may be degenerate such that you can do millions of different sequences. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's just really facts, right, that you're trying to protect. Facts and function, like how do you address that? The information, okay. Well, um, I guess there's two ways of thinking about what DNA does in terms of function. One way of thinking about it is DNA is nothing but a set of instructions directed towards a cell <coughs> which cause it to perform certain functions. Okay, those are the functions. And what I'm saying, copyright would not cover that functional aspect. If, if, you know, so you couldn't stop somebody from writing another DNA code that would achieve the same functions. I'm not sure if you're getting at the, the other um, form of information that probably pops into a lot of people's minds is genetic testing. Testing an individual to see do you have, so the, 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 the Supreme Court myriad case was BRCA breast cancer um, gene, you know, testing. So that would clearly be very problematic if copyright was to prevent somebody from testing individuals for certain mutations in their genes. 
Um, I think the originality requirement, I would think, goes a long way toward guarding against that because you wouldn't be able to have any copyright protection for any kind of naturally occurring genetic sequence, which is the information you're really interested in. And if for, so I think that should be enough in principle. If it ever came to be more of a problem, um, like I said, I think the nice thing about copyright is there's such a strong precedent for statutory limitations. So just like Section 117 of the copyright statute creates specific exemptions for software so that a person is not infringing when, the com when it gets loaded on their computer or when somebody makes a copy to work on it. You could have an exemption, you know, basically uh, any type of genetic diagnostic testing or anything like that is exempt from any uh, infringement. I'm not sure if that's kind of part of the- That gets part to of kind of where I was. Uh, maybe an example would, would, would help crystallize this. There are many ways that I can describe a story about a boy wizard who uh, fights, you know, in a in a castle in medieval times, and come up with very different stories. Right? Each one of those is copyrightable. It's much more. It's uh, in my mind, it's much more difficult for me to copyright uh, many stories to get at a protein that glows in the dark when certain circumstances occur. Right. Mm-hmm. I. I I think there's a huge number of ways of making fluorescent proteins, mm -hmm. right? So as you're saying, at the DNA level, there's a virtually infinite number of redundant, you know, genes, DNA sequences that'll code for the same protein. Correct. So, so again, now we're that. That's why I was trying and, to get to the protein versus the degenerate yeah. DNA sequences. And again, we're getting into the factuality and functionality versus expression which yeah. is what copyright is really supposed to protect. Yeah, right. so I, I, I think my experience doing protein engineering, there's actually a lot of ways of changing a protein, protein okay. sequence without changing function. Uh -huh. you know, so I don't want to get into the weeds too much of that. Right. But I think- if that's true, then that kind of- really Yeah, and I, but I think the point is, if there was only a very few, so fundamentally, this is how I teach copyright. There's this, Copyright is to protect expression, but it's also important that you don't tie up ideas. Mm -hmm. And if you get into a conflict where you cannot protect expression without tying up an idea, idea trumps, and, you, and there's no protection for the expression. So in copyright, the famous case, Morrissey, it involves instructions for how to play a game. You know, it's kind of a sweepstakes game. Right. And the court said, well, you can't copyright those instructions because there's only a few ways of expressing them. And if you start copywriting those, you end up copywriting the rules of the game. So I think it's kind of, it's a factual inquiry. Right. But I think if, if it ever became a concern that, oh, you're gonna be able to tie up the function of this protein, um, under well-established copyright principles, there would, be no ex there would be no protection for the expression if that was a danger. That's too easy. Come on. <laughs> well, I think you've answered all my questions. Okay, all good. Now, so all thank right. you very much for being here. All we right, thank you so much. Good. And if anybody wants to come and ask a question now, that's fine too. Come down and ask a hard question now. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what they want to do. That's a bad question. I want to ask, but it's probably not a hard question.